So yeah, in this talk I'm going to talk about kernel sharp and about uh, kernel tracing. Uh, but I'm not a real kernel developer. I used to be an experimental physicist. I joined uh, VMware six months ago to work on instruments for uh, tracing data analysis and visualization. And in this talk I'm going to talk about kernel sharp. Uh, so kernel sharp is not a new project indeed. Uh, the first version of kernel sharp was written in 2010 by Steven Rosted. Steven is uh, the creator and maintainer of F-Trace, the official tracer of the Linux kernel. Uh, he initially created kernel shard using GDK2. Uh, right now, we are porting kernel shard to Qt, and uh, basically we decided that we have to, it's better to start from scratch uh, and take advantage of all the lessons learned during the development of the first version. Uh, in particular, improve the data visualization model uh, in such a way that it will uh, be able to process in a reasonable amount of time significantly larger amount of tracing data. So, okay, with this introduction, let's go to slide number one. Uh, so I was wondering what can be the best way to introduce the problem which we are trying to solve with kernel sharp and I first came with uh, this slide uh, which kind of express uh, my feeling when I'm trying to understand the language of the machine uh, but then I said that maybe this is a little bit too much and I've added this uh, joke uh, uh, to my presentation uh, so yeah, just read the, the joke what I'm trying to say here is that this is not a presentation about uh, robot poetry. I'm going to speak about uh, human understandable things. And I will try to uh, convince you that there is a way to understand the, the machine, the language of the machines, uh, and this way is the visualization. Uh, so, yeah, I don't have to introduce you the Linux kernel, uh, but the point is the Linux kernel has control over everything that's happening on a system, on your system. If you run uh, a Linux computer on your laptop and you really want to understand what's going on inside, the best thing to do is to ask the kernel, because kernel knows everything. But how can you ask the Linux kernel? One possibility is F-Trace, which is already, already in your computer right now if you run Linux on your laptop. It's ready to be used. Uh, it allows you to look inside and see everything, and when I mean everything, it's uh, literally everything. Uh, you can see every single, almost every single function inside the kernel, and in most of the cases, uh, seeing everything is a good thing, uh, but sometimes it can be a problem. Uh, the way F-Trace works, basically what you can do with F-Trace can be uh, broken into two main categories. Uh, first thing is static tracing uh, with trace points which are already placed uh, at different uh, places inside the, the kernel. Uh, the position of these uh, static trace points is uh, designed with the idea to provide the best possible monitoring. So you can monitor the, the scheduling, for example, you can uh, monitor the input-output operations, interrupts, that's one thing you can do. Uh, the way this thing is done in F-Trace is uh, via a system of micros. Uh, if you are just uh, looking inside the code of the kernel, uh, looking for a really scary code, that's one good place to go. Uh, it's a code, uh, this, the code that is generated by these micros is really hard to follow. But on the other hand, it's a very easy to use. If you want to place a trace point, it's, 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 so, it's very easy. Uh, the other thing you can do uh, with F-Trace is a dynamic uh, kernel uh, function tracing. Uh, this uh, part of the tracing uses a special feature of uh, the GC compiler, which was uh, uh, developed with the idea of uh, profiling. Uh, with, when you compile with a special option, GCC will include a code to a special function inside every single function that is compiled. Uh, initially this was a, a call called uh, mcount. Right now, uh, actually, a trace uses another call, 
called, uh, which is the name is app entry. Uh, the difference between app count and app entry is that uh, basically the, the two things are just uh, hooks to which you can attach a callback. Uh, but uh, when you use app entry, you can also access not you not only know that this function has been called, but you can also access the parameters uh, of the function. Uh, well, you, you may ask, is this thing somehow, uh, is there effect, is there uh, a way, how this thing affects the performance, for example, if, you, if every single function inside the kernel calls a callback, probably this will affect the kernel uh, performance. No, it doesn't, because at boot time, all these uh, uh, calls are set to no, so uh, there is no measurable a change in the performance. This was tested and there is no measurable change which you can observe after uh, uh, including, after compiling with this special option. Uh, so F trace can, when, when doing function tracing, can show function uh, call graphs for function stack traces. Uh, these are different ways of presenting what is going on in the uh, inside, but this is outside of the scope of uh, my talk, so I'm not going to explain this. Uh, I think the slides will be available at the conference website. On one of my backup slides, I have a list of some useful links with documentation where you can find uh, this thing explained in the details, or you just have to search Google in Google F Trace and you find out of uh, tutorials, uh, talks, Okay, I'll use it. Okay, how does it work? So here I'm going to present you a, a very simple session without pretending that this session will do something uh, reasonable, something uh, that is useful. I will just show you how to load the tr tracer, how to get the tracing machine spinning uh, for a while, collect some data and then shut down everything. Uh, without once again say, without pretending that uh, to collect something which is useful. If you want to uh, do something useful, yeah, please uh, follow the documentation. It's out of the scope of this code. Yeah, going back here. So, the control of FS uh, is going through uh, a special file system called TraceFS. And this file system holds all the control files used to set uh, to, uh, to, to set uh, your user requirements and, and access the data generated by the tracer. Uh, by default, uh, this uh, gets mounted here, but of course you can mount it in arbitrary place, and you have to be root for you. If you want to use F-Trace, you have to be root. That's the only way. Uh, if you go to this uh, directory, you see uh, uh, a lot of files here. The name of uh, most of these files are kind of self-explanatory. Uh, for example, you may see this file available tracers. You can see this uh, buffer size in kilobytes, uh, buffer total size in kilobytes, uh, current tracer, for example, events, free buffer. I guess it's, it's uh, obvious that if you want to free the buffer, you just have to uh, access this file. Uh, so, uh, there are many different ways of um, manipulating these fi files. In this uh, example, I will show you how you do this with the bash, uh, with shell commands. Uh, I think this is the most common thing that people are using to, to do tracing, but there are also other ways, of course. Uh, so let's uh, go through this uh, simple session. For example, if you if you do cut available tracers, uh, you see, so this is what I, I see on my out of the box Ubuntu. If you if you use uh, a different if you use the door for example, you may see something a little bit different. But the key players will be still here: function tracing, uh, function graphs, uh, and <laughs> this one is the. No, so this is how you turn off everything. Uh, so, uh, usually the, the session starts like this. First, you echo zero into this uh, file tracing on just to make sure that you don't record anything. Uh, then you load 
the tracer which you are going to use. In this case, I'm going to use function tracing. So I'm just echoing function into this file. Now, at the point when you are ready to take data, for example, you have started your application or you did something and now you want to collect data, you just echo one into this file. So that's when the data recording starts. But actually the time when the tracing infrastructure is loaded and it starts working is here. So that's where, 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 you, where, where tracing starts working. It just doesn't record anything. Once you do this, the tracing data gets recorded into a ring buffer. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why this thing is not really useful. Because if you just do uh, a naive thing like I did here without setting anything, uh, this will generate a huge amount of data and uh, even if you set the size of the buffer to be of the order of gigabytes, this buffer will overflow in less than a second. So your data will be, will, will be lost. Uh, you have to be um, more uh, be clever, but this is again out of the scope of this talk. And that's how you, you stop tracing. Usually when something is happening, the thing which you are interested in is happening, immediately after this you have to say, uh, you echo new zero into tracing and this will stop recording and will prevent something being written on top of the data which you are interested in. And, and of course then, that's how you shut down everything. Okay, let's try to uh, see what we just recorded. Uh, if you want to see everything, you just can, can do cut and cut this trace file. Uh, this is not very useful for showing a conference because in this case you need a lot of slides to show all the data that has been generated. Uh, that's why I'm using here head just to show you the very beginning of the, the buffer. Uh, what you see here, it starts with this header which explains uh, what you see below. Uh, here is the name of the task. That's the process ID, CPU on which the task has, is running, that's the timestamp in seconds. Uh, so what you see here, so this fun that's the trace record of this, this function being called, and this function had been called from here. And yeah, you can see how this uh, thing progressed. Now imagine that you have to go through millions of lines like this in order to understand what's happening in your system. Uh, for obvious reasons, uh, this can be hard. Uh, so let me just summarize uh, everything to here. So F-Trace is really an extremely powerful instrument. It's, it's very power powerful. Uh, if, let's say, you are an experienced kernel developer and you know exactly what you are looking for, then yes, F-Trace will give you the, date, the information that you need. Uh, but what if you are an experienced developer, but you're not so certain about what you're looking for, or what if you don't have any idea about what you're looking for, then what can you do with uh, such a large data set of trace records? Uh, one possible solution is to use kernel shard. Uh, but before going to this, I have one other slide. Uh, so everything which I just explained so far uh, can be done with this uh, control files of uh, F-Trace. There is another way of doing it, and this is using uh, a normal user space command line tool, which is called Trace CMD. Uh, also, Trace CMD does one thing, uh, one ex has one extra feature, which is very useful. So Trace CMD reads the buffers of F-Trace and records the information into a regular files. So if you run and collect uh, some tracing data by using trace CMD, uh, first of all, you have better chance than uh, no data will be lost. Uh, of course, if you, if you do the, the stupid thing which I did in the example, some data will, will be lost, that's uh, guaranteed. Uh, but F-Trace uh, allows you to record uh, data which is bigger than the size of your buffer. And then you can spend uh, the whole day or one week
just try to understand the content of this file, or you can send the file to your colleagues to ask them for help. Uh, once again, you need to be root. Uh, there's no way to, to collect TraceNet without uh, having a root password. Uh, and you can do almost everything that can be done via AppTrace with TraceCMD. So this, in this case, instead of using the, the Trace and Pass file system, you just do trace CMD manuals, options, 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 options. And the, once again, this is documented. There are tutorials how to use this. Okay. Let's assume that we already have uh, the data. And in most of the cases, uh, you can end up with having hundreds of millions of trace records. So, what do you do in this case? Uh, analyzing uh, such a large data set is uh, hard for obvious reasons. Uh, for example, if you want to study the performance of one particular process, uh, and let's say that this process uh, starts a uh, number of threads, and these threads are jumping from one CPU core to another, so the data that uh, is associated with these threads will show up at random positions inside this uh, uh, tracing buffer. Uh, also, that's not all. So you have to understand the impact of various events over your process of interest, for example. Uh, and all the information that you need comes together with a huge amount of data which is completely unrelevant to your program. So how, how do you deal, deal in this case? Uh, one possible solution is to provide a graphical visualization. Why graphical visualization? Well, in principle, the human brain is, uh, if, you, if you ask a machine learning engineer, uh, he would tell you that the human brain is a machine for image processing and not a machine for text processing. Uh, so when you look into an image, you have something which is usually called situational awareness. Uh, first of all, you can see the overall picture and how uh, your particular uh, process of interest is situated inside this big picture. You can see uh, how the, the things which are, you are interested in are correlated with, with other part of the data. You can see patterns which are uh, shown up again and again and repeatedly. Uh, this can be sometimes a key for solving your problem. So, Kernel Sharp is the front-end reader of the uh, F-Trace uh, data. The application has two main viewing areas. So, on top you have this graphical display, and you also have the table showing the records in uh, text format. Uh, the important thing here is that the graphical uh, interpretation of the data is not here to replace the text form. It's here to provide you with a complementary point of view. Because at the end you have to go and read these lines of tracing data line by line. Uh, what the graphical interface will help you is to decide which line to, to read and which line to ignore. Uh, also you have two panels uh, which are there to help you doing navigation and searching. Okay, so that's how kernel sharp uh, looks like. And uh, so seeing the graphical visualization, uh, you may probably ask uh, me, why do you think that uh, this complete mess of colors can help me understand something? Uh, well, First of all, I have to start with uh, saying that this, uh, what you see here is a little bit exaggerated. Uh, so here you see the visualization of uh, one particular uh, tracing data file which was uh, carefully crafted with the idea to create extremely messy trace. Uh, actually, that's how the real-time scheduler was debugged uh, with uh, this uh, uh, kind of tracing data. So, when you see something which has 
way too many details, uh, what can you do, what do you think? Maybe try to zoom in, if you have too many details. So let's try to zoom in. So if you zoom just a little bit, you may start seeing a kind of time structure of the records. Uh, so let me try to explain a little bit what you see. So this particular tracing file has been uh, generated on a machine with four CPU cores. So you have a one time series being plotted on each CPU core. And you, you see this uh, horizontal uh, bar which changes color. The color here, here indicates the task which is running on the CPU. And when I say task, I, I mean what the kernel understands as task. Everything that has a context is a task. So if you uh, have a program which uh, creates a number of threads, each thread will be a task here. Uh, so when you see this bar change in color, this means that uh, a context switch is happening and the, another task uh, is starting on the, the CPU core. The tiny vertical bars are the actual positions of the trace records. Uh, on top, you see the time scale in seconds. Uh, so, okay, we see a lot of records here. Let's zoom further, do a deep zoom. If we zoom further, you see this thing. So now, uh, the GUI will show you on top a particular time window, much shorter this time, with a bunch of uh, trace records being visualized on it. And you see a list here. So how can you correlate uh, the two things? Uh, there are two ways, uh, simple ways, uh, intuitive ways. Uh, you can either click on one of these lines here, or you can double click somewhere around one of these vertical bars. And you see this thing. Uh, so that's, that's the particular tracing record. And that's how it's visualized here, so it's, it's situated here. Okay, so you have selected one uh, record. What if you want to select another one? Uh, so you probably didn't notice, but on top you have one bottom which is uh, marked in green right now. It's saying marker A. And another one which is gray, it's saying marker B. So if you click on marker B, marker A became passive and marker B became active. And now you can do another click and it will select for you a second entry. And you also see the time difference uh, over here between the two entries. This is in seconds. Uh, actually, there is a third way of uh, selecting uh, an entry, uh, which is using the search panel. If you specify the search condition, for example, in this case, uh, oops. I guess I step over the cables. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, so if you specify a search condition here and press uh, enter or next or previous, uh, you see that the active marker will start moving and the same will happen in the graph area. Okay, I already mentioned the, the search panel. The search panel is very useful in combination with uh, the dual marker. Uh, for example, here I'm searching for a task which uh, in his, his name contains uh, XChat. And I'm pressing next, next, next. At some point you may say, ah, this one is interesting. I want to remember this one. Then you switch the active marker to the other one. So this the active, the active marker B in this case will stay here. And when you continue clicking next, the marker A will move. And then we can, you can come back to marker B, marker A, switch, vice versa. And also the, the, the time difference will be displayed. Uh, so, so far we support just two types of plots. 
but we are experimenting with different visualization techniques. So far we have a CPU time series, which is uh, what I already explained. So we have everything that is running on a given CPU and the core indicates the task. Uh, you can also do task time series. In, it's practically the same, but this time the color indicates the CPU on which the task is running. Uh, for example, if you don't want to, if you're not interested in what's going on on CPU core one and two, you can turn this off. Uh, you can select uh, which task you would like to use. As already mentioned, this is uh, data which was used to debug the real-time schedule. So, in this particular case, uh, a special executable called migrate is running when the data has been collected, and this uh, this executable starts a lot of threads each one having different priority. Uh, and for example, here I want to visualize the three uh, tasks, the, the three of the tasks which have the highest priority. And if I do this, so that's the, after a little bit of zooming, of course, that's what you see here. So you see this, how this task changes the, the CPU core on which it runs. For example, here it runs to one CPU, here it switches to another one, come back to the, the previous one here. Uh, this time, there is a, one tricky thing. So this particular trace entry now shows up in two different blocks. It shows up once here in the CPU time series, and then it shows up here in the uh, task time, time series. Uh, and the view marker will actually help you seeing this. Uh, so the, the arrows are not part of the program. This is just going to be trying to draw <laughs> on top of the screenshot. Uh, but yeah, so the Dual marker will show you, so this particular entry shows up here and here, in two different plots. Uh, we also provide different options for filtering the data. Uh, for example, you may say, okay, I'm interested only in schedule events, I don't care about anything else. Then you can filter everything, filter out everything else with this dialog. Or you may say, I don't want to see particular tasks, or I want to see just this task, for example. Uh, you can do this with the filtering again. There are also other options. You can collect tracing data directly from kernel sharp. And you don't have to run kernel sharp as root in order to do this. But if you want to start the, the recording dialog, you'll be asked to provide a root password. Uh, the way the dialog works. Uh, so far, not all the options of Trace CMD are included into this uh, dialog, uh, but uh, this is about to change. But anyway, there is another way you can do everything, which is, so you first select, th this is, these are the most common used options. So you can select something based on this, then you press apply, and all the options will show up here. Uh, and then if you click on read only and make this thing editable, you may add some extra options or remove something. And then when you press capture, this will collect for you tracing data with the options being edited. Okay, so these are all my slides. Uh, what I'd like to say before going to the demonstration is uh, so basically, we just started working seriously on, on the new version of Kernel Sharp. Uh, a lot of things are about to come, but are not ready to be presented yet. So stay tuned for more updates. Our plan is to release uh, uh, the new version of Kernel Sharp, the cute based version, uh, August this summer. Uh, so stay tuned, and we are going to show new things uh, in the next several months, let's say. Okay, so now let's do the demonstration. It's a little hard because I don't see this on my screen of my laptop. Okay. Yes, it's good. Okay, so now I will open a, a, just a normal file, not the, the 
the one with the crazy trace you get the trace. So let's select one up here. That's how it looks like. So let's make this thing bigger. Okay. So the way you zoom, there are many different ways of zooming. For example, you can do this. Uh, you can zoom out like this. That's what we call dynamic visualization because uh, it's really animated. Yeah, the refresh rate of the projector is not, uh, not very good. Looks better on a normal screen. Uh, for example, if you select something, let's say that we always select something here, and you start zooming, it uses the marker as a focus point of your zoom. For example, let's say that we don't want to, to see uh, the records which are there due to the fact that trace CMD is running when, when this data is collected. So, for example, let's go here and say, okay, hide everything that is uh, trace CMD related. Okay, we will also hide the criminal chart report that I will show you. And you actually see that actually something is happening only on two of the CPU cores. The are files also by like zoom out. Yeah, you have something I mean, in the Not that much. I think I, when I recorded this, I was running the YouTube video in the browser and maybe a couple of other activities. For example, if you move the cursor here, on top you you see you see the entry which is under the pointer being printed. Okay, I think this is enough for, for this young demonstration. Uh, so if you have questions, yes, please. Yeah, so the obvious question here is, yeah, maybe I, I just overheard it, but uh, is it open source? Kernel Shark is open source. Yeah. The, the old version of Kernel Shark is available, I'll show you. Uh, may I have my laptop projected again? Uh, here. Yeah, so you can get the, the old version of Kernel Shark uh, from here, so it's on kernel.org. It's right now it's, it comes together with Trace CMD. So Kernel Shark, the old version is part of uh, Trace CMD. Uh, as already said, the new version is not released yet. So uh, with when when it's going to be uh, op it's going to be open source, and first will show up here. So we will keep supporting the old version plus the new version for some amount of time, not sure not for how long. And maybe at some point Kernel Shark will become a separate project, will be separated from Trace CMD. Probably in this case it will move to GitHub, but yeah, it will be open source. And actually, so as I already mentioned, I'm a newcomer for, to the open source community. I'm coming from the scientific community. And I have a little bit different idea about open sourcing. What I'd like to achieve is actually having a double open source, uh, uh, open source. And what I mean by this, so right now we are starting with just having this uh, GUI. Uh, but our, what we want to achieve actually is uh, together with the GUI to have an API which can be used to uh, do more sophisticated analysis. Because you can't expect that someone will click a million times with the mouse and write everything down in a notebook. Uh, if you want to do something sophisticated, you need a different type of instrument. Uh, that's why we want to also add this uh, 
API uh, which uh, can be used by the user. And when I'm saying double open source, what I'd like to have is yeah, the API will be open source, but then we will encourage or gently ask also the users which are using the API to open source the way they're using this API and the scripts which are there developing for analyzing tracing data. And eventually at some point, kernel sharp will come distribute with a big collection of user scripts which a new user can just browse, choose the one which is closer to his particular problem and start from this script developing his own analysis. I'm not sure that people will volunteer to publish their scripts, but we will see. Thank you for your presentation. It's very useful for analysis and the kind of debugging, uh, debugging process. But uh, I have uh, a question about plans uh, in increasing functionality of kernel shard. For example, very uh, interesting would be nice if it kernel uh, shark uh, evolved in, for example, post debug. Uh, Crash kernel processing. In what? Sorry. In post kernel debug okay. crash. I mean crash kernel processing. It yes. would be most useful. Then we have a runtime debug information. Yes. I mean, uh, is it has possibility to integrate uh, kernel crash with uh, crash utility or some? kind of information for car for well, the, the, the way this can be done is uh, going back here in principle when you when you run tracing uh, you can set up the place where the recording stops obviously the, the recording will stop when you crash so you have to somehow save the buffer at this time and I think it's doable so I'm not working on this particular part of the job, uh, but I think uh, this thing is doable. Uh, but yeah, when you are saying, do we have uh, plans for working on this? Uh, so far, we have a very limited uh, resources uh, as a number of people working on this thing. Uh, if you want to uh, participate in this uh, and help us developing this, you are more than welcome. Uh, in principle, our top priority right now is so, as I mentioned, I'm looking for VMware, and the reason why VMware is interested in this thing is uh, because of this. What we want is uh, to be able to aggregate data, tracing data for m multiple kernel instances, instances running on VMs, and have all this data together with the data from the hypervisor itself and be able to debug uh, this, this type of system which uh, it's, it's not that trivial and that's the direction in which we are working on right now. Does it mean uh, that uh, uh, now Kernel Shark uh, supports only uh, host trace, not remote uh, trace? Well, I in, in principle, the way the kernel shark works, so kernel shark is just a, a user interface for browsing inside the data. You can, for example, collect tracing data on your embedded device, then just copy the file on your laptop, open it, and kernel shark will open it for it. So kernel shark is not part of the tracing process itself. It's just a tool which helps you uh, understand what's going on inside this tracing file. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, what would be interesting from my perspective is a uh, way to compare two traces with kernel shark. For example, if I have a problem with regression, I have two traces, the old system and the new system, the yes. regression, and visualize the differences, the timing or execution path. Yes. This would be very or repeat the same thing 100 times and see how it it changes if there is a jitter or something like this. Yes, absolutely. And the, the point is, that's why I said that we want to go behind the GUI 
because this kind of analysis is not so trivial to do with the GUI. Yes, you can try to visualize and see if there is a visual difference, but what if the difference is so small that you can't see it? Then it's better to have a script which will run and do a more sophisticated analysis. Uh, right now our idea is, and we are working on a prototype of a Python module which uses NumPy arrays uh, in order to provide fast processing of the tracing data. Because once you get your data in Python, uh, you have plenty of options. I mean, you, have, you can use the whole scientific toolkit, do statistical analysis, do even machine learning on this data. So we are working on this, but this is not ready to be shown. Uh, in case of huge uh, data files and a few gigabytes, will there well, I, can, I can open for you a gigabyte file here if you want. If okay, you want. and if it's bigger, yeah. will, I'm Let's asking if it uh, will run such smoothly as you show. Let's open one uh, big file, okay. Yeah, I'll open this one. Trace is very big, so it's almost too big. It takes some time to load, you can see this. I have plenty, but it doesn't load everything to the, so it, it used, yeah, I will go also after this to the visualization model and I will explain you the way it works. Okay, so now if you want to see how is this thing still dynamic? Yes, it's still dynamic, you see. Can do. What about filtering and searching? Well, searching is hard. It, it depends. If you want to search here, it's okay. If you want to search here, it's hard. I mean, searching in, in gigabytes of text is hard. Yeah, we are working on a solution for this thing, but yeah, it's going to be slow. Say it again. Let, you want to see the memory usage. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, now you can see how the memory changes when I'm loading the file, if you want. So let's close this thing. Yeah, you see. <laughs> you can see it here. Uh, yeah, let me explain the, the, the visualization model that uh, you're interested in. Uh, so the visualization model works like this. So it goes through the whole data set, and for each tracing record, it records only the information that you really need in order to visualize, which is a small fraction of the record itself. And then it remembers also the offset of the record. So by the time when you really want to record the entire information, you use the offset to uh, get the record. Uh, and the, the way this thing works is, uh, for example, the places where you really need the whole information, is when you visualize this thing. But the cute widget is clever enough to <laughs> read only the part of the data which is actually visualized right now. So you, in this particular case, you have to do this operation six times. You don't do this on each single tracing entry. That's why it's fast. And for plotting this thing, you only record the minimal information which is really needed to plot the graph. And this means you don't care about all this thing. Uh, you don't care about a lot of stuff here. Because you don't use this when you draw the graph. Okay, I have another interesting question. Um, 
um, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, Intel processors uh, have a new technology called Intel processor tracing, and ARM, on the other hand, mm -hmm. have a technology called ETM. Mm -hmm. Both of them are really deep tracing, so they are kind of, you know, throwing mm -hmm. branches, uh, and consider it in your even assembly code where you go. So, the question is, uh, and also VP organization standards uh, a protocol to communicate, it's called STP. And we have, I guess, we have a driver in Germany to send data with using this protocol. I am going to support this protocol in kernel shark, but for example, if you show some function and you would like to go deeper into the function, you mm -hmm. can see exactly ask my instructions which you are interested in, for example. Yeah. So, in principle, this is uh, doable because the visualization model, uh, which is, uh, maybe I should spend some time explaining this, uh, but it's completely detached from the structure of the data that has been recorded. So, the visualization model can work with the data a format of extracts, but it can work with any data format because the, the key point is we get the trace record recorded by F-Trace and you convert this record into what we call the kernel sharp entry which holds the minimum information needed to draw the graph and this format is completely different so if you want to visualize a different uh, tracing data set which has completely different format, you just have to figure out first how to read uh, the file and then how to convert this format into the format used by the visualization model. And you're done. Yeah, but the question is exactly to unify that because otherwise, yeah, uh, as far as I know, Linaro actually wrote, or ARM, mm -hmm. I don't remember who is the, <laughs> was that, but wrote the tool to visualize STP protocol, uh, data collected using STP protocol. Uh, and sometimes when you're using, for example, F trace, yeah. like to take a big picture, right? Yes. Like you said. But you really need to go inside when you're interested in this really particular one function, one call. Mm -hmm. and that is a point of your interest. In that case, you need either to have two data sets collected at the same time, right? Mm -hmm on the same machine, which also may be interfered with each other. Oh, on the other hand, you need to run two different tools. Yeah, right? so, so you have a lot of knowledge just by running these tools. That's a, that's a problem, yes, definitely. And yes, so I'm not aware of this particular tool you are speaking about, but if, you, if it's useful and you find useful, it's great that, you, that it exists. I will, I will try to learn more. And yeah, thanks for pointing me out to this. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, can, can, can we read the uh, trace uh, 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 from inside the container of uh, the Docker? And uh, so, uh, will I be able to get all the information about what's going on in the entire system and other containers? Well, the answer, the short answer is no. Uh, again, I'm not working on this particular part, the problem, uh, but as far as I know, there is an argue taking place right now. Should we uh, be able to collect data from containers or not? And Stephen doesn't want to do this uh, because of some reasons he has. Uh, but yeah, this is still something which is uh, about to be decided. So, uh, did you try to debug kernel shark with kernel shark? <laughs> Debugging kernel shark with kernel shark. That's an uh, excellent idea. Yeah. yeah, but when when we have the API, so with API we will debug uh, kernel shark. <laughs> the GUI. Shark or yeah, is there already a kernel shark 
some implementation of future plans of the implementation, visualize a memory used by process. A visualize a process which is doing what? Memory of used by process. A memory used by process. Uh, no, but oh, at least I'm not sure how this can be done. But I had a request, request of actually visualizing something else, which is the time to, to be able to, to plot, a, let's say, a histogram which shows the time it takes uh, to allocate the memory. So for example, we have a program which allocates uh, a certain array uh, millions of times, and you want to see the distribution of the time that, it, that this allocation takes. And this uh, can be done with kernel sharp. Uh, at some point it will be done, but right now we don't have this option. Okay, thank you. Uh, you can, you can, in principle, you can measure the time of, of uh, the system calls with, with tracing within kernel sharp. You can measure how much time it takes to do any system call. This can be a very interesting analysis. Uh, so one more question is, uh, some time ago I used uh, a tool called Overfile for profiling the kernel stuff, not only the kernel but also Linux space, but anyway, uh, do you guys have any plans to, in, to provide some functionality for profiling, like showing uh, how much of time uh, some uh, certain function was called, like uh, let's say function A was called like 50% of time. You mean something that's doing something, let's say, like, a, like what Perf did, for example? Uh, yes, some well, profiling. Well, we, we don't want to overlap with what Perf is doing, because Perf is an excellent tool, which already exists. So, we want to be able to add something additional, let's say another instrument which, again, can be complementary, not uh, uh, that will compete with Perf, but will be a complementary. So we are not so interested in uh, doing something which is already exists as a feature in Perf and it's, uh, it's done very well. Uh, but we have, uh, we have plans to make Kernel Shark uh, being able to open, uh, to load uh, files recorded by Perf, because Perf uses f -tracks. At the bottom, uh, we have the same uh, trace records. So yeah, we, we have plans to, to make kernel sharding able to load proof 